Thanks, Claudia. And I've started recording now. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are meeting on traditional lands of many diverse peoples, um, both in Australia and, and New Zealand. And I, I myself am on Wurundjeri country, where it's beautiful and sunny. Um, I pay my respect to elders past, present, and acknowledge the wonderful custodianship that uh, our traditional owners have expressed towards land and waters. Um, Tony, perhaps, perhaps you could turn, mute your um, microphone so there's a little bit of noise in the background we might. Um... Sorry, Katie, I just realised I came without a pen. That's okay. But I'll just sit, I'll sit here and yeah, won't fine. make noise. Yeah. That, or or just, just, just mute, that's fine. Um, <laughs> Claudia has asked me to uh, host um, today's session uh, as she's got um, her often predictable NBN problems um, and it, I'm really really delighted to do so. Uh, Miranda we haven't met in person I don't know but, but it's a real pleasure for me. I've heard about your work so much and it's a real pleasure for me to be able to introduce you. Miranda received her PhD from the University of Chicago where she worked with Dipesh Chakrabarti whose name will be familiar to all of us I'm sure. Uh, uh, but she did her first degrees in New Zealand and later on she held fellowships at Michigan and Wisconsin-Madison at, at Ann Arbor before returning to the Southern Hemisphere and a fellowship and then a permanent position at Sydney University. She then returned to take up a position at the University of Otago, which is where she's joining us um, from today. Miranda's book, The Land Is Our History, won the Hancock Prize in 2018, and she's published widely on race, indigeneity, citizenship, and identity in the modern Pacific world. Miranda Johnson, um, on frontier conflict and the politics of history writing, you're very welcome to our seminar today. Kia ora koutou, nga mahinui ki a koe, Katie, nga mahinui ki a koutou katoa. Um, Thank you. I uh, send my acknowledgements from the lands that I'm on of the Kaitahu people of the South Island to you on the lands of the Wurundjeri people in Victoria. It's a huge pleasure um, to be able to uh, present work online. It would be wonderful to do it in person, of course, but it's, um, it is one of the advantages, I suppose, of our weird world. Um, so I am going to actually I'll just share a screen. I'm taking this opportunity to sketch out some ideas in relation to a new book I've started writing with the same title that I've given to this presentation, Frontier Conflict and the Politics of uh, History Writing. But it could also be the politics of writing history, I suppose. Um, I look forward to your uh, questions and critiques and I really have to emphasize that um, this is very initial kind of preliminary work um, I had aims to be much further down the track of this than 2022 has allowed for. Um, the impetus, and I should probably also say that the, the book is kind of, I suppose, what I'm thinking of as teaching-led research rather than the other way around. So the impetus for this project comes in the first instance from engagements I've had with students in and beyond the classroom. And I want to start with some of these responses. So I've been teaching aspects of a comparative history of frontier wars for around 10 years on and off. Um, and because I can't sit still, that's happened across a, a variety of different campuses um, in the context of a paper on settler colonialism at Madison, Wisconsin, and a standalone paper on frontier conflict that I co-taught with Mark McKenna at Sydney, and now at Otago as a module in the context of a broader war and society course. The lectures and syllabi um, that I've developed for these courses have drawn on a range of examples okay. or cases of. I'm not, my just a second, Moran. We might just we might yeah, just ask everyone to mute themselves, please, so that we don't hear any other conversations. Thanks. Please go ahead. So the lectures and syllabi that I've developed for these courses have drawn on a range of examples or cases of frontier violence across the 19th century, including pitched battles, surprise attacks and massacres in North America 
Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa, with sometimes including examples from parts of Latin America. Lectures survey both what happened and how historians have written about frontier conflict. We touch on imperial representations of major battles, such as Asandawana in the 19th century, and the emergence of popular and academic historical studies of frontier conflict of the 1950s and 60s, focused on the well-known major battles, such as those what at the time of uh, that historiography were called the Maori Wars of the 1860s, the Plains Indian Wars in North America of the 1860s and 1870s, and the Anglo-Zulu Wars of the, 1870s, of the sorry, 1870s. We also examine how, from the 1970s, smaller conflicts, as well as other forms of violence, such as massacres, became the subject of burgeoning historical interest and in theorizing in the, re in the rewriting of the settlement frontier. This is particularly true, of course, of the Australian colonial frontiers where larger scale warfare did not occur. And this more sporadic violence both extends the period of frontier conflict well into the 20th century. For example, if we look at the Coniston massacre in 1928, um, we're dealing with a much closer period in time, of course, um, and it also broadens the range of sources we draw on when we discuss histories of frontier violence, including images, published oral histories and memoirs, films and forms of re other forms of reenactment. In choosing to teach this material, I explicitly try to harness students' moral feelings and their political interests about this history. These are heightened in New Zealand at the moment in relation to the teaching of a new history curriculum, which is itself the outcome of sustained activism by students, the History Teachers Association and others. Um, and it always seems to be heightened in Australia around what is going on um, I, um, and for the time period I was living there anyway. Student interest is also, of course, at the moment, informed by other contemporary currents, the Black Lives Matter protests, the toppling of statues of Confederates in the American South, the Roads Must Fall campaigns, and so on. While paying heed to these political feelings, I aim to encourage uh, that, that those protests generate, I aim to encourage students to reflect not only on what happened, but how we know what happened and the meanings different people at different times have ascribed to this history. I certainly get some pushback around the terms I use or whether I should be the one teaching this material, for instance. But I have also observed considerable ambivalence and uncertainty among my students. They actually don't always know where to draw the moral line on past actions. And this is especially so, of course, when we explore inter-Indigenous violence. For example, the role of the so-called Kūpapa forces in the New Zealand wars or Indian scouts in the American West. At the same time, they recognize that this history bears on dimensions of their racial or tribal identity. Some express guilt about unearned privilege, others foreground the suffering of their people. In some cases, their complex family ancestry as descendants from indigenous and settler families informs their responses to the material we study. Like the New Zealand high school students who brought a petition to Parliament in 2015 seeking a day of commemoration for the New Zealand wars, there's also a civic aspect to their engagement. Many express sentiments about around what they think they should know about their country's past and frustration about what they haven't learned. Another, a number of students at Sydney as well as Otago that I've worked with have thus been very persuaded by the criticisms of ANZAC commemorations in both countries um, notably associated with the work of Henry Reynolds in Australia and Vincent O'Malley here in New Zealand. They condemn a national politics of memory that they argue foregrounds battles fought overseas rather than reckoning with the bloodshed here. And some believe that commemorations can function to suppress or deny colonialism's true costs. However, when it comes to engaging critically and analytically with the primary and secondary sources that we discuss in tutorials and the essays, many students struggle with the material. And this is certainly not unique in my experience to teaching this topic. But I do perceive among some students a particular kind of hesitation in using the critical thinking skills we prize as graduate attributes and applying them to the examples we're discussing in class. This is especially the case, I think, when I ask them to analyze the writing testimonies or transcribed speech of indigenous subjects. One example is the response I and tutors have had to a selection of readings I provided in one class from Black Elk Speaks, 
a first person account of the life of Oglala, Oglala Lakota leader in Holy Man Black Elk, who was born in 1863 and witnessed the massacre at Wounded Knee in 1890. Undoubtedly, this is a difficult text, not so much in terms of its language, but in terms of its subject matter and particularly the context of its production. Stories that Black Elk told to the poet John Nyhart, translated by Black Elk's son and laboriously transcribed by Nyhart's daughter. Indeed, since the book was first published in the 1930s, it's been highly controversial, regarded by some as a white man's version of a native life story. However, the preeminent scholar of the making of the book, Raymond Dinelli, sees it as a quote unquote merging of consciousness that is of Black Elk and the poet John Nyhart. With students, I outline some of the context of the translation and transcription of Black Elk's conversations with Nyhart, and we identify the places where it's likely that Nyhart embellished the text based on Dinelli's research. Nonetheless, many students are quite likely to dismiss it as inauthentic. They associate authenticity with individual authorship, and they're suspicious of texts produced in collaborative and what they assume to be unequal circumstances. In their criticism of the text, some students also assert that Indigenous peoples should tell their own stories on their own terms, and texts like this one, with its merging of consciousness, do not measure up to such political demands. What do these various more and less nuanced, more and less certain responses to learning about the history of the frontier and exploring sources of conflict mean? I take a somewhat different tack than that of say, James Boyce, who recently argued in the monthly in response to the debates around Bruce Pascoe's Dark Emu, uh, in turn in light of the Peter Sutton and Karen Walsh critique of Pascoe's work, um, Boyce wrote that quote, a broad outline of what occurred on 19th century, the 19th century Australian frontier is now so widely accepted that even the so-called history wars have had little impact in changing the new perception. Even many conservative politicians now acknowledge that Aboriginal people suffered from violent invasion and fought back in various ways. So while I have no doubt that the terms of elite political discourse in respect of frontier conflict have changed, and that perhaps too there is wider public acceptance of a narrative of the frontier, one that em emphasizes invasion and indigenous resistance, um, and this is obviously manifested in um, invasion day rallies and so forth in Australia and other examples in New Zealand. Um, this narrative um, that, uh, that Boyce is um, referring to um, Raymond Evans, of course, in his 1995 uh, piece on Australian historiography um, called A Breaking of the Silence Around the Consensualist Historiography of Australia. Frontier Conflict, wrote Evans, was, quote, the first type of conflict history to openly call a consensualist's bluff. It stirred up their pool of silence, invoking in the process some uncharacteristically intemperate bursts of invective, and so on. And in so doing, like Boyce, he thought the possibility for fashioning a new historical consciousness was being instantiated in Australia. Does the acceptance, does the acceptance of the truth of invasion and frontier conflict indicate a transformation in the national imagination as the title to Boyce's essay claims? Other recent essays by Amanda Metalwerk and Tim Rouse have cast a, cast a more dappled light on both how widely the historical truth of frontier conflict is accepted by Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians, and also what the moral meanings attributed to such truth are or might be. Drawing on evidence from surveys con conducted from the Reconciliation Barometer, they highlight considerable uncertainty around what happened and what that history means. I think my anecdotes about what happens in my classes echo some of what Nettlebeck and Rouse highlight, an abiding moral uncertainty around the truth claims of historical narrative, while at the same time, uh, students um, usually often fall into a kind of literalist as well as Eurocentric approach to the way they classify and give credence to historical accounts. So what I've tried to begin exploring with my students and, and I'm hoping to kind of extend in this book. It's not simply whether they do or don't accept that invasion and colonial violence happened, but rather what acceptance or increased knowledge of such stories means to them. 
towards that goal of grappling with the meaning and mattering of narratives of frontier conflict. Today, I just want to explore um, briefly a core premise of historic historiographic <clears throat> inquiry into this field, at least as I'm convening it in my classroom and thinking about it in relation to this project. And that premise is that the national, that na various national frontier myths were unsettled by a revisionist historiography on indigenous resistance as indigenous experiences of frontier conflict became a subject of historical inquiry and debate in the mid to late 20th century. And that this offered an opportunity for a new historical consciousness to emerge as uh, Evans put it. In order to do so, I'm gonna give a very broad outline, a description of the idea of the frontier, the writing of frontier history, and explore a shift to histories of frontier conflict as deployed in different contexts associated with settler colonization. This of course refers to a process by which settlers primarily from the British Isles or Western Europe migrated to new lands and claimed them for themselves with the aim of settling them. This form of colonization can be differentiated from as it overlapped and was entangled with other colonial enterprises built more exclusively around trade or plantation economies. Settler colonization has come to have two reference points, the process of reproduction of European societies and their political and cultural transformation into independent nation states, and the process by which indigenous societies were destroyed or subordinated to Aravista settler, society, uh, settler states. In recent years, it's the latter referent for settler colonization that has preoccupied many scholarly debates here and in Australia. The reframing of, re of colonization in terms of a theory of settler colonialism, as propounded by Patrick Wolfe, Lorenzo Veracini, and others, has been very influential and focused attention on structural violence inherent to this form of colonization, um, and has done so in terms of uh, explicating a binary form and experience to that violence. In some ways, I think this more recent expression of, of the binary in relation, in the context of settler colonial theory, harks back to the idea of the frontier itself and the opposites that the frontier has denoted, old lands versus new lands, centers versus edges, civilization versus wilderness, individual versus collective, refuge versus attack, indigenous versus settler. The idea of the frontier in this context took off in the mid to late 19th century as a way of denoting a particular kind of experience of settler colonization evoked in the, this John Gast painting that I always use with my students. Um, and a particular kind of orientation, of course, to the future. It's worth pointing out that the term frontier refers not only to the border between countries or more specifically in this context, especially the edge of settlement, but that it also evokes the sense of looking or fronting in a specific direction. The idea took on mythic proportion in the American 19th century as a story that venerated settler achievement in the conquest of nature and natives and hailed the progressive improvements that white male agriculturalists made in new lands. Inspired and protected by the spirit of progress, settlers successively chased Indians in the wilderness to the edges of the continent. Myths, the myths of the frontier were malleable and could be shaped to fit particular social circumstances and core political values of different societies. So of course, we often think in a simplistic way of the difference between freedom and independence symbolized by the outlaw of the American West or egalitarianism and mateship in Australasian contexts. The myth was often anti-metropolitan but not necessarily anti-cosmopolitan since the frontier was also imagined as a place uh, where different peoples forged a new identity as Americans, Australians, and so on. As a story of progress, perhaps the story of progress of the 19th and 20th centuries, the frontier myth mostly objectified natives as obstacles that had to be overcome so that the settlement and improvement of, la of land could proceed. Once conquered, natives might fade away or assimilate to the newly forged nation that had taken their place. It also had a remarkably long lasting life. Uh, so 
I've sort of skipped over a bit, but um, the, these myths have um, obviously continued and been reshaped through the 20th century and have had remarkably long lasting, long lasting lives as political metaphors. So for instance, accepting his nomination by the Democratic National Convention for the presidential run in 1960, JFK famously could invoke a new frontier um, and do so unironically in terms of the established myth, giving it a new focus um, while ma maintaining its basic structure. The orientation of Americans to the space age in the context of the Cold War and moral choices facing the American people that such a future posed. The frontier myth, of course, is parlayed in multimedia forms, including popular accounts, touring Wild West shows, movies, and so on. It was commodified and globalized. And these cultural product, products themselves are the um, subject of a, a really important and interesting historiography by historians, including Richard Slotkin, Philip J. Deloria, Annabel Cooper in New Zealand and others who've examined in depth their making and reception in different places, often drawing attention to what Deloria framed out as the unexpected features of such uh, cultural productivity and commodification in relation to indigenous contribution and resistance to frontier myth making. Um, and I was going to include um, a slide that I use in class um, from the Ho-Chunk artist, Tom Jones. I've just put a link to it in the um, comments uh, box for Zoom because I didn't, I don't have permission to um, show it uh, publicly, but um, it's a nice kind of evocation of that uh, um, ironizing of, of frontier commodification. Of course, the idea of the frontier also inspired historical inquiry into and hypotheses about settler societies, the conditions of their development and contribution to world civilization. Most notably in his famous 1893 address to the American Historical Association, the Wisconsin historian Frederick Jackson, Jackson Turner presented what became known as the frontier thesis. As the oft quoted sentences in the introduction to the essay declaims, quote, up to our day, American history has been in large degree the history of the colonization of the great West, the existence of an area of free land, its continuous recession, and the advance of American settlement westward explain American development. The frontier, he argued, fused together a new American race. It decreased the reliance of the American 